What is up, everybody? Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to Topic 3.2. This is on land-based empires from 1450 to 1750. This is on an empire that you probably didn't talk about last year if you took AP9 or Global 1. Unfortunately, you didn't talk about it, but it is a vital, integral part of this time period of uh, global history of uh, Afro-Eurasia at this time it is the Safavid Empire. Um, we talked in the last video about the Ottomans. We will get into, in the next two videos after this, we'll get into the Mughal Dynasty or the Mughal Empire in South Asia or India. And then the last video, we'll get into the Qing Dynasty in East Asia. We'll kind of look at this. And I really set up these units so you can look at them and compare and contrast these dynasties and empires very easily. So it's set up very similarly of contextualization, how they expanded, and then how they ruled with A, B, C, D, and E. So... As you're taking this down and writing these notes down, you might want to look back to the last uh, video just to see some comparisons, and it's stuff that we'll work on in class. But with that said, let's rock and roll. Who are the Safavids? You might be asking yourself, they're an empire that existed from 1501 to 1722. I'll never ask you to memorize those specific dates, but just to give you a little perspective, we're talking about 220 years. Not as long as the Ottomans, which lasted over 600 years, but still, this is a decent amount of time, uh, almost about... A little bit shorter than the modern day United States government, which started in essentially the 1780s through today. So it's still a very long period of time. And please don't, you see 200 years, you're like, ah, oh, it's not that long. It's a very long time that this empire and dynasty existed. So a little contextualization, again, contextualization, what happened right prior to this start that can kind of set up and explain this. So I want to set up the contextualization with who set up this dynasty, who led it. And it's led originally by a guy named Safi al-Din. Um, and if you ever see this at the start of someone's um, familial name or given uh, the name that they, their family name, this means um, family of. So he's from the family of Dean. Uh, so Safi al-Din, he is the leader of a Sufi order. And if you remember, Sufis, uh, the whirling dervishes and kind of this mystical branch of merchant activity and merchants who spread this sect of Islam. But Sufis can be either Shia or Sunni. In this case, they are, this is a Sufi order that is Shia Muslim, and Shias generally believe in a very integrated uh, political and religious life, and also Shias believe that the descendants of Muhammad should be the rightful heirs to the throne. And this Sufi order believe that their leader and their following leaders are descendants of Ali, who is Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law, and therefore they are the rightful heirs to the Islamic empire. And this is where their empire is set up. We're really looking at modern day, give or take. Um, this is ma mainly primarily modern day Iran, if you know your uh, geography, as well as part of Afghanistan. Um, and then they border right on the edge of the Ottoman Empire and the Mughal Empire. And I want to point that out here so I can show you here with their expansion. So like all these other empires at this time, including eventually when we get into the European exploration and empires that they create, this is totally gunpowder empires. These empires are relying on gunpowder and advancing gunpowder technology to expand and go to war and conquer people who don't have the access to it. Really, when we talk about gunpowder, again, guns and cannons are the primary thing. Um, and we're still talking kind of single shot rifles at this point. The Safis are really going to be limited because of who they border. So we have the Ottomans um, to the west and the Mughals and a mountain chain, including the Hindu Kush here on the east which means that they're they they can only expand so far without going to war uh with other people also just as a quick little comparison they are not as diverse as the ottoman empire all right mainly they're going to be there's some turkish groups in here and who would be considered eventually iranians but the ottoman empire is much more diverse in that many people in the ottoman empire weren't turkish and there's a it's a multi-ethnic essentially this is a little more homogeneous or kind of one primary group. They are at the center of trade similar to the Ottoman Empire. We do have the Indian Ocean coming through this way. Uh, we do have the Silk Road, which is passing through here, although the Silk Road is losing its prominence during this time period. So they do have a lot of different ideas here. They're a trade center. We have the Caravansaries, which exist in this area. So a lot of different trade areas. So we have a lot of different people coming through here. And that's going to be reflected in a lot of the Safavid and the Iranian, or in this case, the Persian culture. So the question becomes, how do you rule this? Similar to the Ottomans, we have a centralized government, and this the government the government is led by someone who gets the title the Shah, and in Persian, Shah just means king. And again, like I said, he is the descendant of Muhammad because 
in this case, uh, they can trace it back to Ali, who was Muhammad's cousin and son-in-law. So it's a state authority. It's a religious authority. They're doing both. And the Shah, however, there is going to be, I don't want to say limits, but in a sense, there's, he doesn't have complete and absolute rule because he can't pass any law or decree without the approval from someone known as the Grand Vizier. And this is essentially like their prime minister. So there is some check on the power in that there is some type of, they need law, but he is really a centralized authority. He does have, for the most part, complete control of everything. However, just like we talked about in the Ottoman, this is a huge empire. You can't really just, it, it, it's a time period where you can't just like send out a declaration or a decree and then have everyone follow every single law that you're saying. So you really need like some localized control where people up here can kind of, you maybe appoint this leader or you say that they can rule and then they pass the laws that you want. So in this, we call the local leaders Khans. See, you'll see a connection here to the Mongols. Um, and they rule, but they had to provide a standing army to the Shah. So we allow you to rule, yet you have to provide a military presence for us. Similar to what we saw in Western Europe at this time, but much more centralized. Also, similar to all the other places, you got to build a big palace to show how important you are and show how powerful you are. So we do see monumental architecture built to show power. So we see this is the Ali um, Kapu Palace, which is a horrible pronunciation, but don't critique, don't hate. Um, this is going to be built for the Shah. It is just big. You're going to see a lot of Islamic architectural influence because they are Muslim. Um, so you see the um, pointed arches here. You can see some dome um, or some uh, rounded arches here. You can see almost what look like aqueducts, but this is it's not. Um, and so that's stuff. Also, you're going to see a lot of uh, mosques during this period because they're Muslim, because they're trying to promote their their Sufi branch of Shia Islam. Um, they're going about that. And this is one of the main leaders, Shah Abbas the first amazing mustache, just as a side note. So just to inside some of the mosques and some of the pictures, you can see the um, the minarets here. And then you can see kind of this avresque architecture, um, this very intricate geometric pattern, very colorful, very beautiful, very ornate. Um, you can imagine it took a long time to do this, but it shows their power. So coming to see like, how did they recruit military? How do they recruit bureau bureaucrats? Similar to the Ottomans, there's a very small Christian population, but there is a Christian population, especially up in this region up here that are going to be taken um, from their families and forced into the military. It is not, they're similar to Janissaries in the Ottoman Empire. Um, so they're really going to focus on um, using these Christians, have them convert to Islam, and then have them as their standing military. Unlike the Ottomans, the Safis really are concerned with conversion. And they, they, we have this term that's going to be used, and it's still used today to a certain degree, among some, uh, some groups called jihad. And that's the, the attempt to convert non-believers to Islam. So one of their goals of going out and conquering places is to force people um, to convert to Islam. But it's not just converting them to Islam as a whole. You want to convert Sunnis to Shia Islam. So we're going to have a lot of forcing of religions, not quite as tolerant as what we see in the Ottoman Empire. And as well, we are going to fight wars not only against expanding our empire, but also trying to infringe or go against empires that border us. So there's going to be nine wars fought in this area here between the Safavids and the Ottomans over a 200 plus year period. And they, these two really become arch rivals. They really don't like each other. Um, and they don't they don't get along in any way, shape or form then. And a lot of those religious issues still exist today between Iran, which is located right here, and their bordering countries of Iraq, Syria, um, Turkey, who tend to not get along very well with Iran because of the differences that came about over the past 500 years. Um, in terms of taxation, we do have taxation. You have to fund this army. You have to fund these palaces. You have to fund these buildings. So we have a, it's a very complex taxation system. It's not like in the Ottomans where they just auction it off. They are going to tax everything. I mean, that's the goal of taxes. Everyone taxes everything to try and make as much money for the government as possible to fund this. So we're going to tax farm products. We tax livestock. There's a sales tax on merchant activity. There's tolls to cross bridges and roads, which is very similar to, um, the United States today. There's also tolls to, of entries to enter into certain towns. Um, and all of this allows for really this buildup of the military, paying your standing army, funding these projects, funding the day-to-day -day operations of a large empire over the course of 200 years. So we see this taxation that's going to um, assist with that. Lastly, how do we treat minority groups? 
So this is like, this is a little tricky and kind of maybe it contradicts a little bit of what I just said, but we are going, you had to be Shia Muslim to live in the empire. However, they are accepting of outsiders. So if you come into the empire and you're a Christian merchant, they're not going to kill you. Um, they're going to trade with you. If you're a Chinese merchant who is a Buddhist or um, you're a Hindu merchant, we're going to allow you to trade and we're not going to kill you and force you to convert. So in that sense, they are accepting of outsiders. They're also accepting of outside ideas, which again, seems like a contradiction to this attempt to convert people. But we are going to see a lot of blending in this region between the Ottoman Empire ideas, Persian ideas in this region of the Safavid or Iranian ideas, Indian ideas, Arab ideas. So a lot of this is brought together. They also, the Safavid Empire brings in Chinese artisans, people who are who can create stuff, people who are maybe architects to build and build up their capital, build the roads, build the buildings, build the bridges. So we're going to bring people in from the outside, which again is that kind of contradiction. You got to be like us, but at the same time, we're open to the ideas of others. And this is uh, just one of the buildings and kind of some art. So there's some art from the Safavid Empire that really almost looks Chinese in a sense. So that's what I got. As always, if you got any questions, write it down. Think about those comparisons to the Ottoman. I try to mention some. Think about some things that are different. As always, any questions, write it down. Let me know. You know the deal. I'm out.